Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Our webinar today is entitled Complex Clinical Case Study Review, Advanced SIBO and GI Testing. Our guest speaker is Dr. Jill Carnahan. My name is Lenore Powell. I am a medical education specialist in Genova's Atlanta branch. I'm going to serve as the moderator for today's webinar. We would like to welcome Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Carnahan moved to Boulder, Colorado in 2010 and then opened her medical practice, Flat Iron Functional Medicine in Louisville, Colorado. She was board certified in family medicine from 2006 to 2016 and in integrative holistic medicine in 2005. She founded the Methodist Center for Integrative Medicine in 2009 and worked there as the Integrative Medical Director until 2010, October. Dr. Carnahan completed her residency at the University of Illinois Program in Family Medicine at Methodist Medical Center and received her medical degree from Loyola University Stritch School of Medicine in Chicago. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in bioengineering at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. The presentation and slide deck will be available on our website within a few days of the webinar. You can access these resources, previous webinar recordings, brief video modules, and other materials by clicking the Clinicians tab on the home page. I am now going to turn over uh, the role of presenter to Dr. Jill Carnahan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so glad to have you here listening on our complex clinical study review. So let's jump in. So we're going to cover irritable bowel syndrome and uh, its connection to autoimmunity. We're also going to talk about the connection between IBS and SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Uh, later, I'm going to present some clinical case studies and examples of how you might see your patients in their testing and how to interpret that. And I also want to review causes of fungal overgrowth and treatment. So our first uh, just introduction case study is a 27-year-old female. She came in with fatigue and severe bloating after meals, frequent diarrhea, and eczema. In her childhood, she was treated for many ear infections and had a strep throat um, treat, treated with antibiotics for up to 10 times in one year. That just makes us think about either dysbiosis or fungal dysbiosis because of the frequent antibiotics in the childhood. Um, we know that more than uh, one course of antibiotics affects and alters the microbiome and the diversity for the rest of a patient's life. And I always uh, joke because I don't know of any patients that have had less than one course of antibiotics in their lifetime. She has many environmental allergies and frequent migraines, and she was diagnosed two years ago with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, before she saw me, she went on an autoimmune paleo diet, which is grain-free, legume-free, gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, and she lost about 40 pounds. So this would be an example of the test that we saw with her. Um, this is uh, what we're going to be looking at today is the hydrogen and methane breath test. Um, I prefer the three-hour test. This happens to be a two-hour test, which does give us still good information. The three-hour just tends to go uh, further into the small bowel, all the way to the ileocecal valve and possibly beyond. So we can see a little bit further. And some of these cases of SIBO, in fact, most of them tend to exist in the lower part of the small bowel. In this case, you can see hydrogen levels, methane levels, the combination. And basically, in order to get a good test, you want the hydrogen to start out at baseline at zero. And then if it is positive, it's going to go up over time. Um, your prep is probably inadequate or, uh, or done wrong if it starts with a hydrogen high. That is not an adequate test, and you probably have to have the patient redo it. So um, basically, um, there is methane gas, and it is at the bottom there, and it is, levels are um, in the area of uh, negative two, three, nine, and all the way up to uh, 13 at 90 minutes. And the levels here you can see are positive for both hydrogen and methane. And um, the methane is greater than five, which is our criteria. The hydrogen is greater than 20, which is our criteria. So this patient would be positive for both methane and hydrogen SIBO. And you can see here, one of the other tests um, is organic acids. Organic acids show markers of both bacterial and fungal dysbiosis. 
And in this case, this patient has both, which is why I mentioned it in our objectives, both bacterial and fungal dysbiosis because the markers are very high in both of them. This is important because if you're just doing breath testing and you miss fungal dysbiosis and you try to treat with antibiotics, you're going to get a bad result because the antibiotics will flare the fungal dysbiosis. So one of the things I always do when I'm treating is I check stool, I check organic acids, and I sometimes check breath tests because I want to know, does this patient have bacterial or fungal dysbiosis or both? And it's quite common to have SIBO and CIFO, which is the fungal overgrowth of the small bowel, um, together. So there's lots and lots of papers on IBS and what's the root cause. And this is a differential in a table on our a recent article on some of the different causes of abdominal pain, gas, bloating, and distension. And it can range from gastroparesis to functional dyspepsia to lactose, fructose intolerance to celiac disease, et cetera. But many of these things overlap with SIBO. And I've seen cases, I'll show you a study in a few slides, where a celiac patient takes out gluten, they start to feel better, but they're not all the way better, and the underlying factor that hasn't been treated is either SIBO or CIFO. So this is a really important piece of the puzzle in many of these cases, and I would say a very large percentage, it's been quoted anywhere from 60 to 80% of patients with IBS um, actually have SIBO. So what is SIBO? SIBO is a abnormally large number of bacteria, present in the small intestine. So this is important to understand because number one, it's not pathogens. It's not parasites or bad players like salmonella. This is normal bacteria. It can be lactobacillus, enterobacter, streptococcus present in large numbers in the wrong location. So I say it's like they're having a party in the wrong location. They're proliferating. They're producing garbage. And that garbage can overwhelm the villi and the ability to increase uh, digestion and absorption of micronutrients and many other things. So this is not necessarily pathogens. It's just bacteria that is excessive in the wrong location. Common signs and symptoms include abdominal pain, gas, bloating, diarrhea, um, sometimes belching. Sometimes people will have abnormally uh, bad breath because the hydrogen sulfide tends to produce a rotten egg smell, and the methane gas is our typical, someone with a very bad gas problem, um, and, and the smell is pretty uh, distinct. Anemia, B12 deficiency, malnutrition, bile acid issues, steatorrhea or fatty stools, fat malabsorption, weight loss, brain, uh, brain fog, and systemic inflammation can all result of C from SIBO or CIFO. And commonly, we may see micronutrient deficiencies such as B12 and the fat-soluble fat vitamins, especially vitamins K, A, D, and E. Other factors contributing to SIBO, um, there are things that upstream and downstream help protect us from this bacterial overgrowth. And if these things are not working, this is one reason why patients get SIBO and continue to get it even after we treat. So as a good clinician, one of the things we want to do is say, why did this happen? And make sure we're treating the root causes because if we don't, it'll just come back. So hypochlorhydria or low gastric acid secretion is a problem. They may need to have replacement of betaine HCL. Intestinal motility, a lot of times autonomic dysfunction from tick-borne infections or diabetes or other things affecting the autonomic motility will cause SIBO and make it very persistent. Um, if someone has had surgery or colectomy with no ileocecal valve, they're going to be prone to lifelong SIBO. Um, immune globulin issues, so selective IgA deficiency or um, low IgA would be a, a risk factor for SIBO. And then if someone has poor pancreatic function or poor bilia, um, bile acid secretion, they're going to also have trouble with SIBO. One of the best tricks I learned while I was at a biological medicine center in Switzerland is the importance of bitters. Bitters are herbs that you can take with meals to increase bile acid secretion. Bile acids will sterilize the small bowel and a really important factor in preventing SIBO. It's usually complex, so you really want to look at these things and actually address them as you treat the SIBO so that you get a good result. Again, these are some of the same things. Again, just a study talking about how herbal therapy was effective in SIBO. And this table shows some of the protective factors, like we mentioned. So normal gastric acid secretion, normal pancreatic enzyme, normal bile acid secretion, if someone has motility issues. The migrating motor complex. So this is actually very important, the MMC. 
someone can actually have constipation or diarrhea and have an altered migrating motor complex that is uh, differently functioning. What that means is migrating motor complex is the small bowel's motility system. It is separate from colonic motility. So again, someone could have impaired migrating motor complex and actually still have diarrhea. And what that means is their small bowel is sluggish. This is like I always equate it to a Zamboni on the ice rink between the hockey games or at intermission where the ice is cleared off after they play and it just makes a nice clear surface and takes away all the debris. Um, our own small bowel has a Zamboni and it's called the migrating motor complex. So this clears out the small bowel between meals and at the end of the day when we sleep. So one of the things important to patients when you're treating small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is to actually make them have time four to five hours between meals and at least two hours before bedtime where they are not eating and they have time for that migrating motor complex to work. Because if you're eating, the migrating motor complex is still, it won't be working. So having the time between meals can be pretty important. And if someone has either biofilms or issues with secretory IgA, these are other risk factors. Things that can help secretory IgA are Saccharomyces boulardii and bovine immune globulins or colostrum. This can all be very helpful. So what causes SIBO? Well, I mentioned in the beginning an autoimmune process, and this is called post-infectious IBS. What can happen is uh, after an infection like Salmonella or Shigella, there is a um, autoimmune reaction that attacks um, anti-vinculin, and the vinculin can affect the migrating motor complex and kind of cause a paralysis. So it's very common to have a patient say, you know, every time I went, ever since I went to Costa Rica or Hawaii and got sick, I've never been the same. And this is typically that post-infectious IBS that causes a episode of SIBO. Achlorhydria, we've mentioned, all these other things we've talked about, Crohn's and celiac, short bowel syndrome after surgery. And there's a connection of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and SIBO because when you have this bacterial overload that crosses over into the bloodstream, it goes directly to the liver and can cause liver damage. So one thing I mentioned earlier is if you have a celiac patient that went gluten-free, felt better, but is not all the way better or unresponsive, they frequently have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or lactose intolerance. It's important to test these patients. So this said, in patients with celiac disease, partially responsive or unresponsive to a gluten-free diet, SIBO and lactose intolerance should be suspected. Type 1 diabetes. So type 1 and type 2 affects autonomic motility. So it's really important to check your diabetics for SIBO and SIFO because frequently that autonomic dysmotility will make them prone to stasis and migrating motor complex dysfunction and thus the bacterial overgrowth. The conclusion here is that patients with autonomic neuropathy have a significantly higher prevalence of SIBO. And then history of proton pump inhibitors, very commonly associated with um, SIBO. So if someone has had long-term use of proton pump inhibitors, that's probably an issue and you want to be sure and test them for SIBO. So this conclusion in this study it said dysmotility and proton pump were independent risk factors for both SIBO and SIFO and were present in over 50% of the subjects with unexplained GI symptoms. So very, very important with your patients that come in with symptoms that can't be explained. Some of the questions that I ask are, do you get bloated after meals? Of course, do you have trouble with uh, cruciferous like broccoli, cauliflower, apples, things that are higher FODMAP? And I'll show you that in a little bit in the slide presentation. Um, those are things that might help you uh, conclude that you need to do further testing. And then rosacea, who knew but there's a connection with rosacea and SIBO, and rosacea patients have a significantly higher SIBO prevalence than control. And in this case, eradication of SIBO reduced lesions and actually put many of them into remission. So your rosacea patients think SIBO. Restless legs, I mentioned this earlier, restless legs um, often predisposed to SIBO, and um, you can treat the restless leg if you treat the SIBO. So very frequently, um, if you treat the, the SIBO, the restless leg will improve. And these are the organisms we tend to see. So again, just to remind you, these are not like awful pathogenic organisms. They're actually normal residents. It's just they're in the wrong location. And E. coli, Enterococcus, and Klebsiella were the most common isolated organisms in patients with SIBO. So again, same uh, information, but don't forget the fungal stuff can coexist. And the ways to test this would be the organic acids. And you can do antibodies in the blood like candida IgA, IgG, and IgM. 
And that will also help you determine if there's a fungal issue. Fungal issues can be tricky um, because they don't always present on the stool if they're in the small bowel. So, and there's no breath test for fungal dysbiosis. Um, another big problem is the problem that comes from endotoxemia. So lipopolysaccharides are the coating of bacteria and they can cross over the uh, tight junctions of the small bowel and into the bloodstream where they overload the liver. LPS-induced endotoxemia has been associated with things like cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, obesity, and even mood disorders and sleep disorders. So this is a big deal when these bacterial proteins are crossing over and triggering immune inflammation. And that's where um, they're overloading the liver. So we often see fatty liver disease and obesity because of this bacterial LPS effect on the body. And bile acids is super important here because if you're not producing bile acids, you're going to have more predisposition to SIBO. And again, just correlating metabolic syndrome with the prevalence of changes in the microbiota. So part of this um, epidemic of obesity and diabetes and cardiovascular disease is directly related to the LPS-induced endotoxemia, which can be associated with SIBO. So we talked about these before. I'm going to go right through it. But this is like we talked about causes, but these are also conditions that are associated with. So a few of the new ones you might notice are bariatric surgery, advanced age, and um, cirrhosis. So let's talk just briefly about hypochlorhydria because it's important to understand this um, in treatment. You can empirically test with a betaine HCL over-the-counter supplement, and you can get a Heidelberg test, which is a stomach acid test from the gastroenterologist, but that's less commonly done. Um, you may see low serum zinc, you may see osteopenia, you may see low serum ferritin or B12 deficiency because all of those require betaine. And often in C-react or gluten sensitivity, patients will have decreased production of, high, of uh, hydrochloric acid. This is a common sign you might see on the fingernails. Those little white spots in the ridges can be a sign of hypochlorhydria because of uh, zinc malabsorption. And again, common symptoms, this would be bloating or belching right after a meal within 30 minutes, like as they're sitting down to the table. They may have weak peeling or cracked fingernails, acne or rosacea. They may have undigested food in the stool or have more trouble with protein. Um, they may have iron or B12 deficiency, chronic intestinal infections, and multiple food allergies. And things that predispose are being a vegetarian um, will often decrease production of stomach acid. So if you have a vegetarian who's trying to eat meat again, they probably will need some help with the stomach acid. As we age, about 30% of the population loses ability to produce stomach acid. So this is very common as well. Treatment is betaine HCL with or without pepsin. And you take a cap with a meal and you have the patient ramp that up until they feel either warmth or burning and then back it down. So for example, if they take six caps at a meal and they feel a little bit of warmth and burning in the stomach, that's one too many and their dose is going to be about five per meal. And they can actually dose that out. I always warn them you should not have any intense burning. Um, and if you have trouble with one pill, you don't need it. So let's talk about diagnosis of SIBO and then we'll jump into a few cases. Um, the gold standard is an upper GI aspirate. And a lot of times when um, the docs are doing an endoscopy, they will take that and check. But for um, most of us in clinical practice, the breath test is actually quite a bit easier. So we do now a three-hour lactulose breath test for both hydrogen and methane. It's important to use a company like Genova that does both hydrogen and methane. Um, and then uh, we test those levels. Now, these levels have changed over the years a little. The 20, uh, greater than 20 for hydrogen is absolutely on board. Um, methane, now I'm treating above five, and some of the indicators say that we should go a little bit higher with the methane. So three was an older number. Now I usually go up to five. And again, you can depend on the symptoms as far as when you treat it, because three to nine is moderate. Greater than 10 is very positive. So the methane depends a little. Now, you may or may not know this, but hydrogen typically causes diarrhea, and methane typically causes constipation. So just by asking them their symptoms, you may notice that if they're constipation predominant, they may be more likely to have methane. So that's just a little hint. Um, organic acids in stool are not diagnostic for SIBO. So if you're just doing a stool test or an organic acid test, those are great, valuable information, but they will not tell you about SIBO. So really, the only way to diagnose SIBO is through the breath, te breath test or if you have a GI aspirate. And again, you may see on serum labs some commonly associated vitamin deficiencies to clue you in that there's an issue. So again, this is uh, just like the one we saw earlier. In this case, you can see the hydrogen, which goes well above 20, even just at 20 minutes. And typically, the hydrogen should start low if they did the prep of the test right and then rise if it's positive. If you have someone who starts at 100 or 80 or something crazy at the first breath, they've not done the test right. 
So you really need that low in the very beginning, the first test, and then for it to go up in order for it to be a valid positive. For methane, it typically hangs kind of down below, and you may have a methane start high that is different from the hydrogen. So you may have a line that starts at 60 or 40 and goes high the whole way across. And for methane, that would be appropriate and obviously positive. Here you can see the hydrogen is clearly positive and the methane is borderline. So let's talk about treatment. Um, first thing you want to do is a talk diet with a patient. Five med diets are all over. There's apps now you can find from some of the major um, medical systems. And you can have the patient download an app or give them a handout. And typically what I have them do is after treatment of SIBO, they'll stay on the low five net diet for four to six months. That just helps keep them in remission. And then they can start to add back some of these foods and see if they're tolerated. These are a list. Um, some Most of the popular uh, diets include dairy products, certain fruits, certain vegetables, certain grains, legumes, sweeteners, et cetera. So these are the things. And again, you can look these up online and give them to a patient. Um, apples, pears tend to be high. Broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower tends to be high. Um, those are things, garlic and onion. So sometimes if you're just asking in a good history, if patients don't tolerate garlic, onion, broccoli, and apples, they probably have SIBO. Um, again, these are diets that you can find online. This is one taken on a free uh, website that you can download, and it will give the patient suitable foods and foods not to eat. So again, you can pick one out and hand it out to your patients, or you can have them download the app. And then I would have them follow that for four to six months after treatment. My favorite one, um, free from Allison Seebecker, is SIBOinfo.com. This is an actual combination of both SIBO and, and SCD diet. SCD is a whole nother lecture, but it's specific carbohydrate diet. And Elaine Gottschall found this diet for uh, Crohn's and colitis years ago before she knew about SIBO. And it tends to do with e even more restrictive than just a SIBO diet, but I find it works really well for my tough gut patients. So this is kind of my go-to diet handout. And again, you can download it for free. So just mentioning specific carbohydrate diet, um, she has um, just put together a great book and a lot of data for patients with Crohn's and colitis, which is another, um, a lot of patients with Crohn's and colitis have underlying SIBO. So again, it's a little bit more restrictive than the, uh, sorry, the SIBO diet, but I find the SCD diet is a really great diet for guts where they're inflamed or in the middle of a Crohn's or colitis flare which is, again, not the topic of this lecture as we're talking about SIBO, but even SIBO responds well to an STD diet. Now, elemental diet I want to mention because in the literature, this is one of the best treatments for SIBO. So we're going to talk in a few minutes about the actual treatment guidelines for SIBO, but if you have trouble, you've treated people multiple times, they're not getting better, the elemental diet is kind of the gold standard. It is a, a prescription diet, either uh, studies formula Vivanex, which is available by prescription, or there's now a physician elemental diet available over the counter to, to those of us who are practitioners. Um, either one of these is basically the patient eats, eats that exclusively for two to four weeks. That's all they eat. Now, they need to get enough calories so you can have your nutritionist calculate things caloric need, and they may need to do six to 12 shakes a day to get their caloric need. But by basically starving out the bacteria, this resolves the SIBO. So these are elemental diets with just pure amino acids, free fatty acids, and sugars. And so there's nothing for the bacteria to feed on, and they starve. So very, very successful, 80 to 85% success rate in, an, in a 14-day course. So it's expensive and it's hard to follow. But if you have trouble with your resistant patients, this is incredibly effective. So let's talk about treat, treatment. Um, the typical go-to, which is now FDA approved for IBSD, which is also known as SIBO, um, is rifaximin. Typically, rifaximin is dosed 550 milligrams TID for 14 days. Um, that will treat very well for hydrogen. And you can typically think about every 20 to 30 um, points of hydrogen that are positive, you're going to get a 14-day course to resolve that. So, for example, if the hydrogen goes up to 60, you may need more like 30 days to treat that number. Um, you will add metronidazole or neomycin if there's methane. So you want rifaximin plus metronidazole or neomycin if there's methane because rifaximin alone will not treat the um, hydrogen-positive SIBO. Um, doses for metronidazole and neomycin are 500 BID, again, for 14 days. And then as we said, you're looking upstream to try to find the things that are causing problems. And the lotus naltrexone, lotus erythromycin, Canadian resolor, ibirogas, and ginger, these are all health agents for uh, kinetically moving the migrating motor complex along. So I've used all of those. And if something doesn't work, you can try a different one. Typically, I'll treat for four to six months, just like the diet after treating so that they uh, stay in remission from SIBO. 
Um, herbal treatments you can use instead of medication. These are especially helpful if the patient also has SIBO because, I'm sorry, SIBO plus SIBO. So if there's fungal and bacterial overgrowth, instead of using medications, I'll often use herbs because they will treat both. You can use berberine, oregano, garlic, neem. You can use combination treatments. There's many, many options out there. And typically, I would do six to eight weeks versus just the 14 days. Now, um, if you're having trouble, you may add biofilm disruptors. Commonly in the literature, um, garlic, NAC, and EDTA are great biofilm disruptors. Um, probiotics are controversial because often the lactate-producing bacteria will make things worse. So my go-to is usually spore probiotics. And then I will also um, consider adding the other regular probiotics like lactobacillus bifidobacter after the treatment, but not before. Um, other things important would be spacing time between meals so that you allow the migrating motor complex to work. So four or five hours between meals and no eating two hours before bedtime. And among patients who had IBS without constipation, rifaximin for two weeks proved significant reduction in symptoms. So this is really great. And again, IBS in this case is another name for SIBO. Now, rifaximin plus gargum. Now, you probably heard me say you instigate the diet, the low FODMAP diet after treatment. And the reason for that is there's some study, as in this one, that shows that adding a probi probiotic fiber like gargum will actually increase eradication. So the numbers there was rifaximin alone, 61% um, effectiveness, rifaximin plus gargum, 87%. And the theory here is that you're actually feeding the bacteria so that they're more active, so that they respond better to the antibiotic. Um, having said that, what I typically do is I don't have patients be super strict on their diet until after treatment because um, I don't want them to starve the bacteria, put them into an inactive state. I feel like the antibiotic is probably more effective. So you can add the gargum um, if you want to your treatment. It is more effective. The patients may have more gas and bloating. So that's the caveat. All right, let's go on to a couple of case studies and then we will open for questions. This is a study of a 22-year-old female um, alternating constipation and diarrhea for about a year. She had a parasitic infection about a year ago after spending a college semester abroad. I think it was a protozoa. Um, currently stool testing negative for parasites and she did have a B12 deficiency. So as you can see here, she definitely has some significant um, bacterial dysbiosis. She also has a few fungal dysbiosis markers as well. And those are in the uh, obviously in the upper left um, side of the page. Under malabsorption, you see a PAA that's very high, and that can indicate uh, pancreatic insufficiency. So we want to check for that. Um, and definitely some markers on the vitamin range in the B vitamins that are off, which could also indicate malabsorption. Um, this was her test. So, and again, she had the alternating constipation and diarrhea. So we would expect to maybe see a little bit of both. And we do. We see a hydrogen that's clearly very, very high. It goes as high as 120 at 150 minutes. But the kind of average uh, change is 62 on the test here. So either way, it's clearly positive. And methane tends to get high in the lower part of the small bowel. So they're really both positive. So let's go back for her. What we would probably want to do is um, treat with either herbs because um, she does have some fungal markers, um, or we could do rifaximin plus neomycin or rifaximin plus metronidazole. Um, she did have a history of a parasite. It sounds like it's negative and treated, but if I did suspect someone also had a protozoa, I would choose rifaximin plus metronidazole because metronidazole would also cover any protozoa. Um, if I did the medication course, I would probably put her on nice statin for the yeast issues. So this 55-year-old female significantly bloating and constipation for several years. She has a history of hypothyroid and GERD, and she takes over-the-counter antacids and laxatives. It's interesting because a um, couple things here important. The hypothyroid will uh, contribute to SIBO because often you have poor motility or you have um, decreased body temperature, both of which are slight risk factors. And then the GERD for which she's taking antacids, um, that might be contributing to lower stomach acid or it might be a root cause of hypochlorhydria, and that would also contribute to SIBO. Okay, so um, this 55-year-old female, this is her test, and she had predominant constipation. So you see it's kind of flipped here. Um, you see that the uh, methane in the black is very, very high, and the hydrogen is actually quite low. So a couple of interesting things. First of all, she is a clearly positive methane SIBO, 
And I will tell you up front, these are harder to treat. They're just, they are, they're more resistant. They more often come back um, and they're more likely to have constipation. Um, the second thing is with this high of levels, you're probably going to need a little bit longer course and then say two weeks. I would probably treat her for at least four weeks, maybe longer. And then the last thing is sometimes the methane can hide the hydrogen. So you treat the methane and you retest and then you find that there's hydrogen that's high. So don't be surprised at that because sometimes the methane is actually, eat, the methane producing bacteria eat up the hydrogen gas, which sounds crazy. Um, and then it looks like the hydrogen's low. But if you treat the methane, you will see next time that the hydrogen is, is high. That's not uncommon. So for her, what we would probably do is uh, give her the combination regimen with Axman plus either metronidazole or neomycin. I might do a month of treatment for her. And um, I would definitely be supporting motility, probably low-dose urethromycin after we finish the course of um, rifaximin plus neomycin. Okay. And uh, one more case here. We have a, a seven-year-old male with history of bloating and diarrhea. And this is his test. And, um, and you notice here, <clears throat> this one is only two hours, but in general, when I'm, when I'm testing through Genova, I always take a three hour test because it just gives me more data and there's no reason a patient can't do one extra hour. Um, so this happens to be a two hour, which is adequate, but I do prefer the three hour. So he has clearly, um, very high on his hydrogen above the level and he's borderline on his methane because it does go above five at 120 minutes. Um, so <clears throat> this patient, I might try because the uh, methane is so borderline and because Metronidazole and neomycin are a little bit more harsh on the normal bacteria. I didn't mention earlier, but rifaximin <clears throat> has evidence that it um, allows about 95% of the colonic bacteria to remain intact, and there is typically no resistance in treatment over time. So a couple of really neat things about rifaximin is it's not absorbable, doesn't go systemically, and it doesn't really hurt the probiotic colonies. So you're pretty safe using that. And if you need to retreat, it's usually effective the second and third and fourth time. So this guy, I think I would do rifaximin, um, and I maybe do a 30-day treatment because, again, his higher levels are in the 80s, which means that he's going to take more than 14 days to clear it. Okay, so 44-year-old female with constipation, and you can see her test right here. Um, now, interestingly, with the constipation, um, you do have the methane going above there, but it's not as high as, remember the lady, we have the black line. So this one, definitely methane is contributing, and it's probably going to be a little bit easier to fix because the highest for methane goes to 17. So in this case, again, you could do um, rifaximin plus either neomycin or, or metronidazole. I would just do a two-week course. An alternative for her, since her levels aren't extremely high, um, would be to treat with herbs. Um, some of my favorites are the combinations um, that were studied against rifaximin. There's a combination from Metagenics called Candibactin AR and BR, and they work very well for a four-week course. And there's a combination from Biotics also studied against rifaximin, and both herbal regimens were more effective. The combination from Biotics is dysbiocide and FCCidal. And so in this case, um, because it's not super high, and um, I may treat with four weeks of herbal, um, herbal uh, medications. <laughs> Okay, so we are nearing the end, so I should be able to take your questions shortly. But just to, to tie it all together, tests don't guess. And if, even if you have stool and organic acids and they're pointing to a problem with bacterial overgrowth, um, you still need to do a three-hour lactulose breath test to confirm. You also want to check to make sure there's not CFO because very frequently the fungal um, overgrowth co uh, coexists. You may need successive rounds of treatment. I started to mention this in the treatment. But if a gas is greater than 35 to 40, um, you probably want more like a month of treatment versus two weeks. The average decrease of antibiotics is 25 to 30 parts per million. And then methane, I mentioned, is much harder to treat. Um, you can do the double antibiotics, or you may try allicin and uh, garlic extract. It tends to work for methane. There's not a lot of herbs that work for methane. So if you are going to treat with herbs with methane, I would use the garlic extract. It's one of the few things I found to be fairly successful. Um, sometimes uh, biocidin and olivirex can be used as well. Um, I would recommend retesting two to four weeks after completion of therapy to make sure things have resolved. And if, it, if you have failure, you have to address motility. I gave you about five different options. And it's very important to keep those patients on both diet and motility agents for up to six months. And again, diet, you have to address or relapse will occur. Some patients do better uh, fairly long-term on the low FODMAP diet. The downside is um, the reason that works is they're starving the bacteria. 
So a low five minute diet long term may not be the best thing because you're not uh, supporting the typical probiotics that we need for diversity. So I don't like to keep people on a low five minute diet forever. Okay, and then other things of why it may not work, um, if the SIBO levels are too severe or there's an underlying issue like total autonomic dysfunction, uh, dysmotility, um, something else you're not dealing with, um, you may not resolve it or you may need a longer course. Uh, methane needs dual treatment. So if you try to treat methane with just rifaximin, you will uh, not be successful. And there are some bacteria that are not successful. Older treatments of SIBO were ciprofloxin and doxycycline. There's a few others. But obviously, those are um, not as uh, inert. They will cross over into the, uh, the they're systemic, and they would probably have a bigger effect on the probiotic colony, colonies. So I still prefer rifaximin. And there is instructions in the breast prep, but the basics are no beans, um, white rice, and water, fast right before. And uh, don't do immediately upon waking. You want to have them do 10 clearing breaths. So these instructions are all in the, um, the Genova kit for the patient. Okay, so I would love to open it up for questions, and thank you all for bearing with me. Thank you, Dr. Carnahan. That was a great presentation. So we received quite a few clinical questions. Um, let's go ahead and start with um, this one here regarding the use of garlic, which is in terms of dietary garlic intake, it's considered a high FODMAP food, but is it okay to use during treatment? Do symptoms become exacerbated? Oh, so great question. So we're talking garlic food and uh, allicin extract. So first thing is garlic food is one of the highest five naps, so they'll want to be off that while they're treating for sure. Or like I said, you may actually have them on it. And then after um, the treatment regimen, you take them off on a low five minute diet. But the allicin extract that I'm talking about in treating methane SIBO is not garlic directly and will not exacerbate symptoms. Thank you. So regarding patients that you suspect to have a biofilm that is causing the treatments to be a little bit more difficult or not as successful as you would hope, what biofilm yeah. disruptors do you typically use? Oh, perfect. Um, I'm getting a little echo, and I wonder, Linda, it's just while I'm talking, could you try muting to see if I... Sure, sure. Okay. Okay, I'll try that. Oh, much better. Thank you. <laughs> as soon as I'm done, you come back on. Um, so uh, the things I use for biofilm disruptors are um, n acetylcysteine, and you can go pretty high in doses, anywhere from 600 TID up to 2 to 3 grams. Um, garlic itself, which, again, I use just the allicin extract that the capsules come in, um, 450 milligrams, and I would use that uh, two to three times a day, which again is also going to help treatment of SIBO. Those are the two really well studied in the literature. And then there's some products with EDTA, um, and my favorite is Interface Plus. So those are all really great options. The one caveat is biofilms can be there for a reason. So I'm not of the fan. I'm not a fan of just willy nilly destroying biofilms unless you know that they are an issue. So my typical um, regimen will be treat without biofilm disruptors. And then if you're not getting a response or it's coming back, then you can add in the biofilm disruptors. Perfect. So in terms of hypochlorhydria and the challenge with betaine HCL, so if the patient does not notice a warming sensation in their stomach after seven capsules, do you typically have them continue to increase the betaine HCL capsules or do you stop them at seven? Okay, so this is a really great question because a lot of people need more than seven or typically conventional wisdom, I've always felt safe at 3,500 milligrams um, as a max dose. And so unless I'm really you know, supervising the patient or I really trust them, I don't ever go higher than that, even if they don't have symptoms. However, I will tell you, I have a, a couple patients right now that are taking 16 to 20 caps per meal, and they're actually having really good results when they get that high. One of them has an autoimmune condition where they're not producing stomach acid, and the other has um, other autoimmune conditions. So I think there's uh, play, playing factors into that, and I would be extremely cautious at going that high unless you are confident that you can trust your patient, because if they do have a gastritis or an irritation or a history of ulcers, and you go that high 
and they aren't able to tell you they're having pain or symptoms like children, I would never do that um, because they can't really tell you, you know, when they feel like burning. If you trust your patient, you could try higher, but that's between you and them. And typically we advise no more than 3,500. So if you have a patient who you suspect SIBO, they have the classic gas bloating symptoms that are aggravated by specific or certain meals, especially high fiber meals, but their breath test comes back negative. And also they have a negative H. pylori test. Um, What would you consider? Would you still consider treatment as if it was SIBO or CIFO or how would you proceed? Oh, such a great question because this is actually quite common as all of you listening know. So um, one of the things I would do is organic acids to help me determine is there bacteria, is there fungus that I haven't seen on the stool or the breath test. There's also something called hydrogen sulfate SIBO that does not, at this point, we don't have the labs to detect it. Now, I think the future we may have that, but right now we don't. So there is a type of SIBO that will not show up on your test. So if they have all the symptoms of uh, reacting to high FODMAP foods, bloating after meals, and you want to try in this case, if I didn't have data, I would typically go with an herbal regimen for two reasons. Number one, if they also have fungus, you're going to treat better with herbs. Number two, if they don't have SIBO, you're less likely to cause any problems with herbs versus medications. Um, but I would probably treat, but you also want to think um, about other causes. So um, gastroparesis or uh, pancreatic insufficiency or hypochlorhydria, they might have any of these things that could cause bloating and gas after meals, and they wouldn't have SIBO. So there's a few things to think about, but I will say I've had like a half a dozen cases where I didn't have the evidence for SIBO and I treated and they did recover because they probably had the hydrogen sulfide SIBO. So it is possible. And depending on your comfort level, you might go ahead and treat. You mentioned treatment with herbs if SIBO is suspected. Can you please just list a few of those herbs? Sure. So my favorite herbs for a SIBO would be caprylic acid, oregano, um, undulaceic acid, uh, grapefruit seed extract, powder arco, uh, turmeric, and ginger. Regarding guar gum, have you used guar gum um, on its own in SIBO treatment, or do you typically use it with rifaximin? And about what is your dosage range? Okay, another great, it's a great clarifying question. So the gargum, um, it was studied with treatment because what it is, it's a prebiotic. So this is the caveat. If you use it alone, you'd make them worse, which is why I don't give probiotics or prebiotics in the wrong form before I treat SIBO because you're adding to the problem. So if you give them a lot of prebiotic food, they're going to have that bacteria have a party and produce toxins and they won't feel well. So gargum in the study was used only with rifaximin. And what it did is it caused the bacteria to be more active so that they were more effectively treated. But it actually made, makes them more symptomatic because you're feeding the bacteria. So I would only use gargum with rifaximin um, as for the study to be more effective. And I would use it if the study dose was two grams per day. In children, do you typically use rifaximin? And if not, what do you typically use for the kiddos? So it is not indicated. I'm not sure what the cutoff is, but in children, it is not indicated. There have been times with parental consent, I have used it for a very significant, obvious case. Um, But again, it's not indicated, so they may have to pay out of pocket. I would not use it in children under eight. So this is more like your teenagers or preteens that I would use it in if indicated with parental consent. Um, Otherwise, I would use herbs. And I mentioned the two options that have been studied head-to-head against Rifaximin, and those are the metagenic candibactin AR and BR and the biotics, dysbiocide, and FC-cidal. So in kids, those would be great options. How do you decide whether to do a stool test or a SIBO test for patients presenting with IBS symptoms? So great question. My typical patient comes in, I do a very full workup and they always get a stool test. So I always start with that. Um, And I would say the breath test is more of a secondary as I'm not getting the data or I have symptoms. If they come in and they have the classic IBS symptoms, I may order a breath and stool right off the bat. But I would say stool, I always do first. And then it's either stool stool or stool and breath test the first visit. Um, Once in a while, if we've looked at everything and we haven't just placebo, then I'll add that in later. But I would say it typically go with stool and organic acids first. After 
treatment, is it common to experience die-off symptoms like an increase in bloating or pain or something like that? Or even mid-treatment? Yeah, so during treatment, some people can feel more fatigue. And depending on if you're using medication, if you're using a dual regimen, that can be pretty, especially metronidazole, and notoriously causes lack of appetite, metallic taste in the mouth, fatigue. So that would be really common for them to feel slightly worse during treatment. But typically, by the time the two or four weeks is over, they feel quite a bit better. Um, I've even had like a five to 10 pound weight loss because sometimes this can contribute to weight gain in women or men. Um, generally, people feel really good. And when you're treating SIBO, I don't see the die off like I do with fungal. So if you're treating both and you're treating yeast, I would go slowly. And the fungal treatment tends to need more like two to three months versus two to four weeks. It's much longer term. And that's where I see the Herx and the, the die-off reactions. I don't see that a lot with SIBO treatment. Just a few more questions here. Um, when, when do you typically recommend your patients dose prokinetics? Like what time in the day and how would you decide whether you would recommend prokinetics for a patient or not? So, um, if they've had a significant history before me, they come in, they've been like they've tried treatments um, and failed. That's when I would absolutely indicate it or do a prokinetic right after treatment. So the, the sequence is you do the two to four weeks of treatment, typically two weeks, 14 days. And right after that, you start the prokinetic and the diet. And uh, I would have them on the prokinetic and the low FODMAP diet for four to six months after treatment to keep them in remission. So that's kind of the sequence. And prokinetics, I would say about 50% of the time I do it right away. But most of the time, I would start it after a failed treatment. So if we do the first course, they fail. The second time, I'm not going to make that mistake. I'm going to do a prokinetic. Regarding probiotics, um, if you use probiotics during treatment, what kind <laughs> or what species? And do you use it during treatment or after treatment? Yeah, so in my, this is clinical experience. I don't have a ton of evidence, but I do find that typical lactobacillus bifidobacter probiotics are not as well tolerated with patients with SIBO. My theory on that is that the SIBO organisms uh, are often lactobacillus and other enterococcus and things. So we're actually contributing to this problem if we don't take care of the root cause. So I don't typically put them on regular probiotics right during the either treatment or before I treat them. I do like spore probiotics. Those tend to be really well tolerated in SIBO patients, even from the beginning before you treat them. So I often will use a spore-based probiotic, and there's many of them out there, and use that actually during treatment or even before treatment, and they usually tolerate it very well. If I do add in the lactobacillus bifidobacter, it's usually um, after the treatment and after the four to six months when they're on the diet and the motility agent. And the last question I see here is, in terms of hypochlorhydria challenge, do you typically use betaine HCL or have you ever used pepsin HCL? Yeah, so um, the, most of the brands out there are betaine HCL with pepsin. They have both, and most people need both um, for this. Uh, so I'd say 90% of people require betaine with pepsin. There's a few people like me that don't tolerate the pepsin, so for, for someone like myself, I would do just the betaine HCL. By itself, but either way works. I would always start with the betain HCL with pepsin. I think we've addressed all of the questions. Um, I'll wait a few seconds to see if any more questions come through. Oh, here comes a few more questions. <laughs> okay. Um, so when patients' breath test values are high and you treat for um, a longer period of time, uh, do you start with a 30-day treatment or will you just still do the two rounds of 14-day treatment when you have patients with really high breath gases? Yeah, so um, again, this might be something, if you're just starting out, I would probably stick to the FDA prescribed 14 days, you'll get it approved easier and everything, um, and just be aware and see what you experience. Because I've done this for 15 years, what happens is I, I see... Um, the levels that are high, and I know, okay, a 14-day course isn't going to quite adequately treat. So what I used to do would have been do the 14-day course, two weeks later, check them. It's partially down, but not all the way down, and then repeat the course. And if you're unsure or just starting out, that's still a perfectly acceptable way to do it. 
again, with my experience, a lot of times now I'll just go directly to a 30 day course when I see the levels higher than say 30 or 40 on the hydrogen. Um, and you can just get a better result in the beginning, but there's no real wrong way to do it. You can also just do 14 days, retest and treat again. That's an okay way to do it as well. Is there a particular brand of Allison that you use? Yeah, great question, because there is one brand out there that's above all the rest. Um, it's called Allen Med or Allen Max Pro. Um, it's a 450 milligram. I think the professional version is Allen Max Pro and the Allen Med might be over the counter, but they are both 450 milligram of Allison extract per cap. It's definitely the most effective. It won't bother people who have a garlic sensitivity. And um, when I dose that for methane SIBO, I just four to six caps per day. And that's usually four to six weeks of treatment. So patients who might have a parasite present along with a positive SIBO breath test, do you ever use um, a linea or how do you approach that type of a situation? Yeah, so another great question, because I'm always looking and saying, what am I treating here and how can I combine all the treatments to fit everything? Because they might have H. pylori or a protozoa like blasto or um, so this is a great question. You can definitely use the metronidazole. And I, I mentioned metronidazole because it comes generic. It's easy to get. But I typically myself use tinidazole. Same class, less side effects and less resistance. So I'm hardly ever using metronidazole. I'm almost always going straight to tinidazole. And that would cover the protozoa. Um, Alinea is a newer treatment that has been studied for tough SIBO, especially methane SIBO. And it's shown to be quite effective. It's also effective for protozoa and for viruses. So for the tough cases where you suspect multiple things going on, Alinea for 30 days can be amazing as a treatment. Um, I have seen Alinea flare yeast. So if you do try Alinea, I would want to make sure that there's no fungal things going on underneath. And I've never used it as a first line. I always still use it as a second line treatment when they've failed. And it's wonderful. But again, I don't typically go to it first line. Can you talk a little bit more about the 10 clearing breaths um, that we might consider taking prior to our first SIBO breath test collection? Yeah, so it's pretty simple. You would just want to have your patients or if you're testing, um, you know, breathe in and um, out through their nose 10 times. They're just trying to basically get a little bit of a uh, make sure their airway and things are clear before they start so they get an accurate test. And that's part of it. If they haven't done the diet appropriately or the breath clearing breath appropriately, um, you might see that hydrogen start out high. If you ever see a test where the zero time marker is a high hydrogen, it is an invalid test. You want to have them redo it. It's probably because they haven't done the clearing breath. But it's pretty simply like any sort of yoga or deep breathing would do. Just a nice deep breath. You could hold it for four counts in and four, four to eight counts out and do that 10 times and then uh, start the test. Regarding organic acid testing, when would you consider ordering it so that you can look at the yeast and the bacteria dysbiosis markers? Um, yeah, every patient. <laughs> I always get organic acids because it's so helpful um, on these. Like you have to, and if you're going to be treating SIBO, you have to be know, you have to know, you have to find some way that you're testing for fungal because I'll tell you what, you'll miss it if you're not looking for it and then you'll make the patient worse. So if for me, every patient gets organic acids. If you could review again, how long after the completion of treatment do you consider retesting? Yeah, so they recommend two weeks. And sometimes if the patient's doing really well, I'll go a little bit longer. So basically, you're doing rifaximin and neomycin or rifaximin by itself two weeks. And then two weeks later is when you would test for cure. And if it's normal, then you go, go about low plasma diet, maybe motility, prokinetic agent for six months. Um, if you want, sometimes if I think they're doing better, I won't retest until they have symptoms. And that could be three, six, 12 months later. So it's really up to you. But if you want to prove that you've treated them adequately, you could test two weeks after cessation of treatment. So in the interest of time, we will end our question and answer session there. So for additional education materials or assistance setting up a MyGDX account, we'd like to encourage you to visit our website, www.gdx.net, and or you can contact client services. We also offer complimentary appointments with our medical education specialists to answer questions related to our testing, including choosing the right test and reviewing patient test results. 
Finally, we'd like to encourage you to register for our upcoming webinars on www.gdx.net. Next month, we will have Dr. Philomena Trindade presenting on women, menopause, insulin resistance, and Alzheimer's, what is the link, and several dynamic speakers to follow in the upcoming months, including Dr. Drs. Pam Smith, Stephen Goldman, Ann Shippey, and Elizabeth Board. Thank you again, Dr. Carnahan. That was a great presentation, and you've answered so many wonderful questions. We really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thanks to everyone for listening. I really enjoyed it.